Okay, uh, good morning. Can everyone hear me? Great. Uh, just wanted to make a big uh, shout out to my fellow Marines, Semper Fi. If anybody had any uh, concerns about security with three Marines in the room, uh, it's well in hand. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the airlines very quickly. Uh, started in 1928, eight mainline fleet types, uh, 4,200 flights a day, 50,000 employees, and 17 billion in top line revenue. Uh, oops. Uh, as Alan said, as of Thursday at 5:30, uh, we now have 13 mainline fleet types, 6,000 seven flights a day. 75,000 employees and 35 billion in top line revenue. Technical, technical operations. Uh, we grew as necessary to facilitate the airline's maintenance. And since deregulation, as you're well aware, uh, we started the expansion and contraction. If anybody's ever worked in the uh, MRO uh, environment, we found that it typically takes about two years even somebody that comes in with a license, an AMP license, it takes about two years to get them up to speed on working aircraft parts or anything to have to do with the, with the aircraft. So the constant contraction and expansion uh, didn't bode well for us. We work all the different disciplines of uh, aircraft maintenance. Uh, we have 6,500 employees uh, worldwide. In our Atlanta facility, we have about 63 acres uh, from which to, to work from. But the only problem with that is, uh, as a caveat, uh, large complex entities are often slow to change. So uh, you can uh, put in what you want to after that. So part of our strategy, uh, as far back as 2000, was we had to move away from the perception that we were a call center. Uh, we realized very quickly as a maintenance provider to a traditional legacy carrier. Uh, when they looked across the field, uh, they looked at a big bucket that they were continually having to put money into. So we had to move very quickly. Uh, we had to grow our capabilities. And you can look at the left-hand side of the screen. We had tremendous uh, capabilities. So uh, 2000, we began to get in. We once called it a hobby when we started in 2000 of bringing in uh, th that work uh, from a third party uh, outside the airline. And as you can tell, uh, we started to grow uh, rather uh, rapidly. Uh, but then in 2005, uh, you can probably tell me what happened to Delta Airlines in 2005. It was the 800 pound gorilla in the room. Uh, we bankrupt. We went into bankruptcy. And if anybody in the room has ever lived through that environment, it is not a nice environment. So we had to, that was another, we had to make a choice. We had to make it very quickly. Either we were gonna move to uh, cope with bankruptcy and all the fewer resources that we were gonna be provided, or we would have been outsourced. I mean, we, we were on the chop, chopping block. So in 2006, we bankrupt, we had a massive layoff, we reduced resources, and in 2005, we were unable to meet third party requirements or the airline's requirements. So we were getting very close to axe time. About February of 2006, uh, we were probably about 11% worse than we were before as far as, keeping up, as far as keeping up with demand of our customers and Delta Airlines. So March of uh, 2006, we sat down uh, with some folks from Realization. And in about a month, we had come up with a detailed plan using TLC methods to turn the place around. July 2006, we implemented. Eight weeks later, uh, we, we had already, we were looking at a 25% increase in productivity. And by the end of 06, as you can tell by the numbers, we had caught up that 11% and then some. Uh, we re this uh, $312 million was a stretch goal. 
Well, really, 300 million was our stretch goal. We exceeded the stretch goal by 12 million dollars. So at this point, our third-party customer base is about 50 percent of our work now outside Delta Airlines. In the past, before we implemented TOC, uh, we have eight different product lines, and they all use the same shared resources, which I currently are under my leadership. We would bring the engines in, disassemble. Each supervisor of those product lines operated independently. They would induct the engine, tear the engine down, down to the piece part level, and then throw the piece parts over the wall. The key challenges, challenges with that was we never had the parts when we needed them. And I, I actually put the caveat at the end, you can put any nasty word in there with the after that you, that you could imagine because I've heard them all. And when it came time to build the engine, we would do what I call noodle. You've seen the guys uh, on the riverbanks reaching in the holes for these big catfish. Well, we were doing the same thing for, piece, for parts. And when we finally had enough parts, we would put an engine together. Fluctuations in engine demand. We all have a, uh, an issue with that. The airline still ex uh, expands and contracts. Our uh, uh, flight schedule expands dramatically during the summer. So our demand continuously expands and contracts. We have eight different product lines, as I said, worked independently. We have changes to work scope. What we thought was going to happen when the engine shows up in the parking lot is not necessarily what we see when we tear it down. So uh, a lot of variability in that. Resources not available when we needed them. Uh, Delta engines have a different maintenance program, different piece part requirements than our third party uh, customers, and testing rejects. Once we send the engine to test, anywhere from eight hours to 18 hours later, uh, it takes about that long to go through an extensive test on the engine before it goes to fly. And if anything doesn't, if anything is wrong with that engine, it has to come back to the shop, so we have to cope with that. I know Mr. Elderman mentioned that uh, we looked at root cause. Uh, we immediately, in 2006, it was if we just had enough people and we just had enough equipment, we could take care of this issue. But when we looked in the mirror, uh, people and equipment was not the constraint. Uh, I guess uh, uh, Mr. Ederman, Eckerman, hopefully I got that right, mentioned it was management. Well, I think that's probably a growing theme uh, that management was a constraint. And it's how we manage those things inside our companies. We, we're, we're sure that we're doing the right thing. In the MRO industry, uncertainty. That's uh, probably the best word I can describe in our environment is the uncertainty. And just the inherent uncertainty causes delays. And it's how we manage those delays. In your company, just like mine, we typically try to manage those delays by pressuring folks to start early. Not, don't care if you can get it done, just start it because I'm going to be that far ahead later on, right? I'm sure you've already you've, you've heard that. So we continue the multitasking. We've been told for years that the best managers are the ones that can multitask the best. Once I have 50 engines across the board that are half built, what is the natural human reaction to that? Well, I've got 50 engines. I only need two parts for this engine. I don't care where it is in the line. I'm going to reach back into the constraint, and I'm going to try to pull those two parts up front. Or let's just rob it. We'll rob it from the other engines that are already half built rob those two parts. Let's get this engine out. <clears throat> or if I can't do that, let's just buy it. That'll get me out of the hole. So with that, I'm confusing the priorities. And everybody knows what happens when I confuse the priorities. My lead times go up. So those delays that I was trying to manage, what happens to those delays? 
they increase. Well, I got one up on it. Well, let's just get the engine as soon as it hits the parking lot. Let's pull it in as quickly as possible because evidently I need more time. So as soon as the engine hits the parking lot, I'll bring it in, disassemble it, get the parts into the system quicker. And as you know, whip begins to climb. Queues begin to get longer. So it confuses my priorities even more. Right. So we've created this negative reinforcing loop, all determined by your management. And hopefully you can all read this. Competing management objectives. We drive more uncertainty into the process. This, this isn't the, uh, <clears throat> the simplified view. This is what we implemented. This is how we took care of all the chaos. Release and priority. If those are the two words that I could choose for this conference, it would be release and priority. So we began, I have to reduce the whip in the building. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to stagger those engines coming into the building. I'm going to take that away from the frontline supervisor. I'm going to create a master scheduler. He's going to take a beating, and he has, because he's going to push back, because he's going to control the whip at the engine level. That's the first piece of that. Now that we've staggered the engines in based on a whip level to achieve the turn times that we want to achieve, I tear the engine down into mods. Those mods are torn down into piece parts. Well, we have a secondary release mechanism that I cap the number of parts going into the repair and support organization to 300 a day. And we break that down by hour. So we've taken the variability out of the induction and out of what we release into the repair organization. Then, once we've completed the disassembly, disassembly and assembly is controlled by critical chain project management. We looked at it and we saw that it was lower volume, high variability, aligned very well with CCPM. And we implemented CCPM on the assembly side, and, and I'll, I'll, the product lines, I'll, I'll speak of them as the assembly side. They're the ones that tear it down and, and build them up once you get them the parts. At D0, that's the end of disassembly. It's controlled by CCPM. Those parts are released into the system. But there's a caveat. We don't release them into the system. We hold those parts until 15 days prior to assembly. And I guess you can imagine when we said we're not going to release those parts until 15 days prior to assembly. Typically, it took about 60 days on average to turn a part through the repair organization. And it was a huge paradigm shift, or even for the culture, to even fathom 15 days. And I've been asked several times, well, what formulas did you use to come up with that? There really wasn't a formula. We looked at all the parts that we worked in-house. And we looked at touch time, oven time, and tank time. The worst case scenario we had was 156 hours. So if we look at it as a crow flies, how many days is that? That's only five days. Everything else is less than that. I know Dr. Gorett mentioned yesterday only about 10% is actual touch time. The rest of it is waste. So we added five days because we knew the variability in the process. And we tacked on another five days as a buffer. The first 10 days were worked as FIFO. The red five days, the buffer, is based on due date. The part is worked FIFO. As soon as it turns red, it's based on due date. It'll move to the, wherever in the queue necessary based on due date. And we also have one last mechanism is an expedite tag. In the past, we had over 200 expedite tags. Now we have only 20. And those are for those extraordinary Murphys that hit, which do hit the MRO industry, or, or our environment every day. And it's talked about every day among all the leadership 
of where these 20 tags are going to go. It's a very controlled process. And once we put a tag on something we don't think is going to get back by E0, it, it, it moves very two days on average, unless it's that 156-hour part. But it moves very, very quickly. The D plus 2 and D plus 7 is really what we call exception management. It's those parts that go outside that we really don't have that much control over. They leave the building, they go to a vendor, and they come back. But what was happening was sometimes those parts would never leave the building. So we had to get a good control mechanism in place. So at D plus 2, at D0, full bill of materials turned in. D plus 2, those exception parts, our repair coordinators actually make sure every one of those parts has left the building. At D plus 7, we're calling the vendor, did you receive the part? Because UPS and FedEx don't always get it there. Did you receive the part, and when is it coming back? Very controlled process. And at D plus 7, we can start assigning those POs to those engine requirements at that, at that time. We release the uh, non-exception parts into the system at A minus 15. They turn red at A minus 5. At A minus 2, exception management begins again. Every day, we talk about every single part for every single engine at A minus 2 and above. And it's a very, uh, I guess you could say it's a very, it can be a very heated meeting. At the beginning, our culture wasn't used to not so much the accountability, but the forcefulness. And actually, that's a lesson that we learned from our, our uh, Marines in Albany. You need to know where that part's at. And is it going to make it by A0? And what you're going to do to make sure that it reaches the engine on time. And we have a very strict rules, very strict rules that we follow to make sure that that part gets back by A0. At A0, we start the engine assembly. You will not start before A0 because we use critical chain for disassembly and assembly. We pipeline into disassembly, but we also pipeline into assembly. So if the parts are not there and we have an engine that's cleared, we'll pipeline that engine into assembly because I know people have said, what if I'm using a flow line? Well, we don't introduce the engine into the flow line until I have all my parts. So I never run into, I'm in the second bucket of work and I'm stopped. So you stop the whole line. We've mitigated that. We don't start until we have the parts. And we certainly don't start before A0. Assembly begins. And as you can tell, we've, we've buffered disassembly. We also buffered the repair process. And we've also buffered the assembly side. And then the engine goes to test. The summary of the changes, we created plans with buffers. The assembly disassembly have their buffers. The repair process also has a buffer. We control the whip, a uh, very strict process. We control the engine whip, and we also control the piece part whip in the repair shops. Managing using buffers. In the repair shops, we're working red parts. If you're complete with your red parts, guess what? You're just working FIFO. On the assembly disassembly side, you're working red task. Very simple process, very simple priorities. Exception management, uh, I talked a little bit about it under the, the, the simplified uh, 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 environment that we implemented. OSR parts, we look at them very, uh, we, we, we keep a good handle on our outside vendors using this exception management process at D plus two and D plus seven to make sure on time delivery. Uh, and we also review every part for every engine at A minus two. That gives us two days to work something to make sure that we get those parts back. But we follow a very strict guidelines around those rules. And if you step outside those rules, there, there, there are uh, ramifications. Lessons learned. Hindsight's always 2020. Uh, we should have driven the change faster. 
we got great uh, goodness in the first eight weeks of implementing uh, a DBR scheduling system in the repair shops. Uh, we really, we waited too long to implement the CCPM on the disassembly assembly side. We, we could have done it much quicker and got gains much faster. We should have set more aggressive goals, which right now, this week, we are actually in the mode of, of resetting those goals and they're gonna be much more aggressive, uh, even to the point that it scares me. We should have sync line, front line training. In our infinite wisdom, we just like to get things done. Uh, we were warned, but sometime, no matter how good the warning is. So let's just get the training out of the way. We train folks about two or three months in advance. So what happened when it came time to turn the switch, they'd forgotten everything they learned. Uh, wish we'd have wrote out Concerto, which is a small piece of the CCPM, was the IT piece of the disassembly assembly. Uh, the central release area. I failed to mention the central release area. Initially, uh, we, I like to use the word trust but verify. Uh, we trusted that the uh, supervisors at the front line would hold those parts until A minus 15. Just due to human nature and competitive juices, it started to, you know, I'll get my parts in maybe a day early because I, I gotta beat this guy next to me. So pretty soon we didn't have any rules. So those parts coming out of disassembly will go to a central holding area and we have a, a different group of folks that release those parts based on our DBR scheduling. Establish a process for exception management much quicker. Uh, I know Dr. Gorett uh, speaks a lot about uh, new rules. Uh, we made the change and we didn't create the new rules and it came back and bit us, so we went back, created those very strict rules around uh, exception management, which has really uh, uh, done very well for us. Management lessons. Uh, we should have set up a series of management offsites just to keep us aligned. Uh, I like to use the, the phrase, it's like herding cats. Uh, you've got different managers and just human factors kicks in, competition, we start to go off in different directions. So we needed to keep everyone aligned. Ensure metrics were in place faster. Uh, we were still using the old metrics, a lot around utilization. Since then, we have implemented, we, we use very few metrics, and we all use the same metrics. We look at WIP every day, throughput, and turn time. It's the only metrics that we look, look at outside of safety and defects. Those are the other two measures that we focus on a great deal. Better anticipated reaction from finance. Who would have ever known? Pressure to hold back production to meet budget. And that's just an environment that we, as an airline provider, we live in it and we, we have to manage it. Taking a TOC approach to inventory and capital. Uh, we were still in the mode of what do you need each supervisor would give me a list of 15 things. You don't really need those 15 things. Go back, come up with another list. They would come back and they'd have maybe one less. So then the questions I started to ask was, how many more engines are we gonna put out this month because I purchased this piece of equipment? And if they couldn't answer it correctly, then they wouldn't get the equipment. Uh, management involvement and critical exception management. Exception management. Uh, when I go out, and I've had the opportunity to go out and look, and, and look at what other people have done, I think we did a good job of coming up with a very, very simple solution, looking at very few things. We created a robust system to control release and priority. And there's a hundred other things that we would like to control, but if you start adding that into the fix, then you no longer have a simple, elegant fix is those things that you have to manage and you have to stay on them. The more variable, the more you have to stay on those. You have to react very quickly. And each day, that's when we, we have a production meeting every day. The general managers and below are in there. Everybody that has skin in the game is in that meeting. 
we hold each other accountable, and we make decisions very quickly. What used to take months to make a decision on what we needed to do is done in a day to keep things moving. Results. We did have 20,000 piece parts in the system. We now have 5,000. We had 60 engines, but now we have 75 to 80. Our rate of production, we produce about 120 extra engines a year now just from the simple solution. 25% increase in productivity. We have, when we started, we had less than 10% of our parts needed at A0. We now have 97% plus. And most of that 3% is those exception parts. And that's part of our going forward that we are actually going out working with vendors. You know, it's no longer acceptable. A 45 day turn is no longer acceptable. 50 engines a month plus, we've, all, we've had quite a few 60 engine months. The four year historical average was about 38 engines a month. And I wanted to add one caveat to that. Through this, after implementation, we have not laid off anybody. But I can say that through attrition, we're 211 employees less in the last year and a half after implementation, we, just through attrition. But something new has happened when, you, when we're looking at new demands and resources. Uh, my folks are saying, I don't really need those people. I can handle that demand. And the flywheel is moving so fast, it's really incredible to me how far we can go with our current resources. In my opinion, I think we at least have another 20%. The biggest part, revenue. 2006, we had a hard time catching up that 312. We met that stretch goal. We survived. The company looked out across the field and they saw not a bearing tree, but a tree that had little dollar bills all over it. 2008, forecasted, was about 450, but we set a stretch goal for 470. We were at 470. We will go over half a billion dollars by the end of the year. Our unit cost is down by about 12 and a half percent. That's even with extraordinary material pressures. And uh, my good friend from the steel industry, uh, he, he probably knows over the past two years, you can imagine the material cost, especially around titanium, ink and L, those things that we need as an, uh, an aircraft industry. Uh, astronomical expansion in cost, but we've still been able to reduce the cost 12 and a half percent. One last question I'd like to answer. The question always comes up and hopefully I've provided enough time for questions. I enjoy answering questions. What would you do first if you had it to do over again? By all means, I would start with TOC. It creates the umbrella from which everything else operates. I can use my Six Sigma tools, my lean tools, because now I understand. I know how to identify that constraint. I know how to, I have the brain trust to exploit it, right? I understand the subordination. But I guess that'll be, uh, history will tell whether we did it right or we should have started with TOC. We, st we, we used TOC, great results but we already had the brain trust in place. Anytime we identify, we can, we can fix it very quickly. Uh, we had trained over 500 green belts in the company, over 200 black belts, and about 28 master black belts. And I, I, Dr. Gorett used the term mosquitoes. We, we created a hell of a lot of mosquitoes. So now we, we can direct those mosquitoes to the right place. Focus, outside vendors, our supply chain, uh, exception management. We continue to try to get faster in our decision-making capability. Uh, inventory reduction. Uh, I didn't uh, put a slide up for inventory reduction, but I know we've sold over 8,000 parts from engine maintenance. 
since 2006. And we have plenty more to get rid of. And uh, working now to try to improve the uh, sales production synchronization. I'm sure everybody in the room probably has heard of that. Uh, so with that said, uh, first I'd like to thank the TOC ICO for inviting me back. And hopefully uh, you've learned something from the speech. I certainly have learned something from you folks. <laughs>